Benvenuti a tutti. Welcome everyone. Welcome to this uh, path towards the understanding of a reality that is very close to us in spite of it being far away. We will be led by two very important persons who are well known by the audience of the meeting, two persons who contributed to the interpretation of this reality, who helped us understand this reality. So we are asking them an answer to the questions that this reality generates on the role of religion and particularly the role of Islam. Muhammad bin Abdul Karim al Hisa, his uh, statement, a statement, sorry, and he is the head of a very important global organization, that is to say, the World Muslim League, that represents over 50 countries, not governments, non-governmental organizations of different countries. For each country, there is one representative, and this, uh, these representatives choose, elect uh, the uh, secretary general, who is elected by thousands of organizations of ONGs to represent their work and their interests. His uh, CV is really long. I don't want to take any time away from our uh, meeting of today. I can just say that an important driver in terms of uh, change has always been His Excellency Mohammed bin Abdul Karim Al Issa. He's been working for uh, women empowerment. Also, when he was Minister of Justice, he was the man who made it possible uh, to women to become lawyers. So we are uh, really, we have great expectations from him and do we hope we will go beyond traditional diplomacy that talks about uh, the teaching of all religions that um, are against extremism and violence. Today we will go beyond slogans uh, and we will tackle reality and uh, its challenges. Our uh, second guest today is a Professor Olivier Roy, and uh, I'm one of his students in a way because I've always read his books uh, since the 80s. Uh, he underlined the difference between uh, Islam as a religion and Islam as a political project. Nobody before him explained so well this difference. Again, he has a very long CV, but for the most fascinating thing for me is that every single book he wrote provides a new approach to the reality he studies and also a new language. He actually created so many words without which we cannot even understand Islam. So welcome, welcome Professor Roy to the Rimini meeting for the second time. So now we can start our journey and we will 
start with uh, the difference between Islam as a religion and as political ideology. My first question is, a Muslim who believes that God protects him becomes uh, the Islamist who thinks that he has to protect God. A Muslim who believes in his uh, mind and in his heart then becomes the Islamist who follows his leaders and uh, the Muslim who testifies his uh, faith uh, in front of the others uh, becomes an Islamist and judges the faith of the others. So how can Islam become a political ideology? How can faith become a political ideology? Professor Roy, what do you think? La, le passage de l'islam d'une religion à une idée. The change from a religion to ideology is a phenomenon that goes back to the beginning of the 20th century. In the 1920s, many Muslim intellectuals, they were not religious men, they were journalists, professors, teachers. Well, they started to ask themselves why, in a way, the West is the winner because uh, the Muslim universe has been uh, defeated. So the answer was we have to equip ourselves of the same tools that the West has. From the technical and technological point of view, but also from the point of view of politics, we have to change and to uh, turn Islam into a political ideology. And this lead to a development of this approach from Egypt to uh, India. And uh, there was a model at the basis, the model of communism and the model of fascism. But there was also a third way, so to speak, a third path. But Islam was, again, a political ideology. So we talk about uh, creation or, uh, of uh, an Islamic state. Uh, we talk about writing an Islamic constitution, an Islamic party based on a model that is very similar to that of the Communist Party. So we are trying to uh, put together the Muslim tradition and the great political ideologies of the 20th century. This uh, idealization of Islam does not mean that there is a backfire of religion. On the other hand, on the other hand there is a, a weaker spirituality, a weaker theological research in that same period. Young intellectual laymen then turn Islam into a political ideology. So this uh, trend leads to the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1978. And here, the West discovered Islamism as a political force, a revolutionary force against imperialism. Obviously, this is a non-democratic force. So this is the image the West had of Islam at the time. Everything takes place without the intervention of Muslim authorities who could not actually react to this uh, uh, development, this political development. In 1992, I wrote a book called The Failure of a Political Islam because my idea, my idea was that this ideological building could not 
uh, resist power and the way power is uh, managed. In Iran, there is a dictatorship, but there is no Islamic society. Iran today is probably the most uh, secularized uh, society in the Muslim world. The development of political Islamism led to a secularization of uh, society. So this is the failure of political Islam. Islamic parties either became radical or became parties just like any other. Uh, for instance, in the Maghreb countries, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Islamic parties are conservative center parties that do not have any particular ideology. The death of uh, political Islamism is clear, for instance, in uh, Algeria. 28 years ago, the revolt in Algeria was carried out by the Islamic movement. But today, if we look at uh, uh, the demonstrations uh, in Algeria, there are no Islamic slogans. No one is waving the Koran in the streets. There are no green flags. There is just the quest for democracy and citizenship. And this is what marks the end of Islamism. And moreover, now there is a new uh, uh, space for the for Islam to come back as a religion, getting rid of this political adventure that actually didn't lead to anything. So this is what is happening today. The Islamic religious is independent from the political uh, dimension. It is not easy because uh, politicians uh, do not want to have to deal with a free uh, religious uh, sphere. They want to manipulate the religious uh, sphere, but it is too late now. And I do think that now we can talk about Islam as a religion and we can stop talking about Islamism. Islamism is dead. So we're not uh, only talking about a conflict between various interpretations, different interpretations of Islam and the Koran, but rather here we're talking about uh, uh, something that brought these two uh, religions and political theories together, the political theories of communism and fascism. But like Professor Ra said, this was also possible to grow owing to the fact that Islamic leaders were silent, Islamic scholars were silent, that they did not um, face the challenge. Uh, so, Your Excellency Al, uh, Alaisa, how was this extremism, uh, uh, how has this extremism grown in the Islamic culture? And how came that this uh, lack of stance came into place. In the name of uh, God the Merciful, I am very happy that I have been given the chance to participate in this meeting. In this uh, edition of the Rimini meeting. And I'm happy to talk about this important topic. I would like to say that the phrase political Islam has a, a very long history. Also, from a theoretical point of view, it was first coined in the 20th century. Political Islam started 
well before that period when uh, political slogans started being used. And I'm referring to the slogans which turned, uh, uh, which basically uh, were the expression of the ambitions of some political leaders. The people who used uh, these slogans basically uh, summarized uh, Islam in political slogans. And these slogans went beyond the human values of Islam and the very same uh, uh, meaning and sense of Islam was neglected. That is why we believe that in their uh, modern theories starting from the 20th century, the, there is a possibility to start political debates uh, whose attempt at, in a way, uh, erasing religious texts and promoting uh, their political ideas. These ideas have developed over time and have been drafted uh, into the pages of texts. They've been proclaimed during conferences. And this has happened over the last 70 years, thereby contributing to spread uh, a dominating thought all over the Islamic world. These ideas Uh, also influenced some investigation methods in Islamic areas. And this uh, had, of course, negative consequences. Uh, there has been a moderate Islamic way of thinking that went against these ideas. However, moderate Islam has never been organized and structured organically like uh, political Islam was. Due to the uh, predominance of political Islam, um, the tendency spread not to face a political Islam and therefore uh, political Islam has over time become stronger and stronger. Political Islam was also supported by some scholars, by experts. Some of them have become quite renowned. And these people have strongly influenced the Islamic world. Uh, first and foremost, a pragmatic way of thinking. So a pragmatic way of thinking, this pragmatic way of thinking kind of manipulates all concepts to achieve its goals. But then it goes back to its beginning and with the ideals that it renounced. These ideas were at the very basis of extremist uh, ideas of terrorism and violent extremism. The symbols of current terrorism, like the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, are evidence of this way of thinking. These symbols have been the results of the schools in which the political Islam is being taught, especially, for example, the teachings of the Muslims, of the Muslim brothers. So their evidence is open evidence. They are also being spread in social networks. They proposed a number of ideas which are quite dangerous. And they are particularly dangerous because they 
were targeted to young people. Nothing was present that could uh, represent a barrier between them and young people. So these concepts uh, are based on hatred against uh, the others. So there is uh, this diffusion of hatred against those who think differently. And this is a, a, a hatred which is based on violent ideas. In fact, this is, these are concepts which are completely um, devoid of the concepts and principles of uh, authentic and real Islam. It doesn't contain any of the human values with which Islam was first conceived. Very rarely, these concepts make reference to harmony between peoples and nations. But in fact, these concepts make reference to conspiracy. And they make reference to historical facts which only serve political uh, objectives, polit political objectives linked to the uh, Islamic history or uh, to the story of policies different and, and religions different than Islam. This thinking and its uh, uh, closed uh, mental organizations does not bring about uh, proposals for new debates. We believe that the Islamic world has some kind of uh, embarked on a different path. And we believe that uh, worldwide we can uh, try and fight against these organizations because they focus on the fact that uh, uh, terrorism and extremism have in fact been based on uh, exactly these ideas. In Saudi Arabia, which is one of the most important uh, countries in which the theoretical ideas of Islam are developed, there is a, a center that fights against radical Islam. So for example, this is a center in which intellectual ideas are spread, and they specialize exactly in the details of the ideology. And this center tries to break the ideology down and, and this from the inside. So uh, this ideology has to be fought against uh, with ideas and, and thoughts. You have to fight against extremistic ideas using thoughts, using ideas. This center, the Center for Intellectual Fight, uh, I was making reference to in Saudi Arabia has um, identified over 800 articles written by the Islamic State. And these are articles that promote Islamism. They're very dangerous articles. They're dangerous because they are targeted at the ideas of young people. They try and influence the ideas of young people on the world. They do not focus, they do not come back on the authentic and real culture of Islam. This is a religious culture which is different and far away from the real conscience of Islam. And as such, it is weak because it is based on ideas and concepts that are wrong, that are completely wrong. So it tried to promote these ideas from the point of view of a religious emotion. And it uh, recalled historical events 
So by recalling uh, true and authentic historical events, many of these ideas have been uh, demented. I would also like to say that we do not like using the phrase political Islam. The extremists uh, represent only themselves. Uh, the Islamic world is in good health. And at the time, at this, in, in this very moment, it runs a fight against extremism. So the Islamic world builds bridges to connect to everybody. It respects the others. It respects their presence. It respects the fact that there are other cultures and other religions. So Islam respects everything that is present on earth. And it uh, commits itself to respect constitutions, laws, cultures. as well as minorities. I would also like to say that uh, our future is a positive one and that extremists are isolated. Their uh, thoughts are based on very weak basis which have started to come down. These ideas have to be fought against using other ideas. And our ideas should not be violent ones. I think I've, uh, uh, the time allotted to my part has finished, but I think we can go on later. Voglio solo sottolineare. I just like to stress some statements uh, on uh, from this uh, stage of the Rimini meeting for the first time. A leader, uh, such an important leader, talks about how this extremism has been injected in school books. For the first time, a leader of the Muslim world says that uh, there has always been a, a resisting force against extremism and that this force is now very well organized. This is what we expect from someone like His Excellency El, El Alaisa. We want to talk about the mistakes we made that led us where we are today. But now I would like to ask Professor Roy. In one of his books, he talked about the radicalization of Islam and the Islamization of radicalism. This is a new way of reading this reality, a new approach to this reality. So maybe from his answer, we can understand how these mistakes uh, mentioned by His Excellency Hela Issa can be corrected. When we talk about Islamic radicalism and terrorism in the West, we look for its roots in the history of the Muslim world and in the Quran. But we tend to forget that this radicalization phenomenon is quite recent. It dates back to about 30 years ago. So I have a horizontal approach. I believe that we need to understand Islam in the framework of what is happening today in the world, not as if it were a small island in the Middle East with its own 
single individual problems. We need to face global problems, global issues. I was uh, explaining before how Islamic ideology can be compared with the great political ideologies of the 20th century. And well, with Islamism, Islamism has experienced this, the same story as a communism. There has been um, some kind of a political failure because of this these ideologies could not lead to the just societies they aimed at. The failure of the Communist Party in Europe, for instance, opened or paved the way for two completely different phenomena. From the one hand, there was a return to democracy, especially in Eastern European countries, whereas on the other side, in the 70s and 60s, this led to a violent radicalization of part of uh, our youth. Uh, so some phenomena, uh, Action Directe in France, Brigate Rosse in Italy, these are very interesting phenomena because they involved young people. They were movements managed and carried out by young people that choose violence and that say they are a part of an imaginary community. They, uh, working class, but the working class was not interested in the radicalism of these young people. These uh, radical movements caused so many victims, but then they just disappeared because they were not the drivers of a real utopia. The same happened in the Muslim world. The failure of great uh, Islamic uh, ideologies in the 90s led to the radicalization of young people at global level. These young people identified themselves in an imaginary community, the Ummah, the community of all Muslims. So in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there was a radicalization that was mainly of, uh, well, um, left-winged radicalism. Then it becomes a global radicalism because radicalization is much more violent in the West, in Western countries. There are young people who leave for the jihad in Syria, in uh, Iraq. 25 to 30% are converted. This is the Islamization of radicalization. These are young people who were not born Muslim, but chose to become Muslim and to follow some kind of, of uh, idea of uh, jihad, martyrdom, and they're ready to die for this ideology, either through terroristic attacks or by uh, choosing the jihad, because most of Western uh, uh, Voluntary volunteers who chose the jihad died. So there is this nihilist um, element. These young people are fascinated by death. We see the same thing in uh, the mass attacks in the United States or in the attacks by young students in uh, American schools, as well as in uh, uh, the addiction to drugs, uh, for instance. So I can say that This uh, Islam theorization was the expression of uh, a fringe of uh, the world uh, youth, not specifically of these countries then. It has to be noted that uh, in this uh, radicalization process, there is no utopia. These young people did not leave to build a just society. They went to Iraq and to Syria 
to die there. <coughs> because if maybe you believe in the creation of a, a just society, well, you want to live. You don't want to die. If you want to die, it's because you do not believe in life. So this is this idea of no future. Radical jihadism thus represents the vision of a no future generation, a generation that doesn't think to have a future. This was a phenomenon that is really impressive. There were uh, terrible, violent attacks. And these people were fascinated by a certain form of um, aesthetics in violence, which is in a way part of a global culture. We see that in some movies, for instance. But then in the end, this didn't lead to anything. Uh, the ISIS was uh, actually beaten, defeated. Of course, there are still uh, some fringes in uh, the Yemen, uh, in Afghanistan. These uh, local groups are based on local conflicts, so they, so they will probably go on because uh, these local conflicts uh, were not solved. But at, lower le- at a global level, the jihad is dead. It is no longer attracting young people because the people who actually were uh, impersonating this kind of uh, um, of uh, interest and attraction are dead. So I think there is also the expression of a certain nihilism on the part of today's uh, youth. This is not a religious uh, element. It is not linked uh, to uh, religion. Of course, these young people believe they are going to heaven if they uh, die for uh, the, in these attacks. But there is no participation in a faith community. It is more uh, an individual quest by young people fascinated by death. So actually, there is no future in that. So I do believe that we are now living a phase of post-radicalism, and we need to understand what we can do now, not so much uh, to fight against uh, radicalism, but to overcome radicalism. And we have to stop thinking about uh, radical people. We have to think about all the rest of the people of the society. So we do not have to de-radicalize some thousands of people. We need to understand what we want to do with the rest of the society, actually. When um, So the utopia is dead, and there's nothing to add. Their utopia is death, but we are for life. And uh, I had the pleasure and the honor to participate in the organization of uh, uh, the exhibition of the Muslim League here at the meeting, the compassion that unites us. And in this exhibition, I realized that the struggle uh, carried on by the Muslim League, as uh, His Excellency said, more than what is done in the intellectual centers against uh, terrorism. Well, I noticed, I was saying, that the strongest weapon they use is not against, but for, for life in favor of life, a work of charity. And I have to repeat that this exhibition is the result of a series of meetings among His Excellency Alaisa and the Cardinal Turan and then with the organizers of the Rimini meeting. So when we were thinking about the title of this uh, exhibition, we thought, well, what is it, is it that uh, brings us together? We're all the different people from the West and from the East, from the North and from the South, Muslim and uh, Christians. So they are so different. Why are we here together? So the starting point of every faith, that is to say, acknowledging one's limits, acknowledging that we need 
the help of the others. So this is the title, Compassion That Unites. It is an acknowledgement of this need for others to be there for us. His Excellency said before that there is no moderate Islam or extreme Islam. There is just Islam. And no one can talk in the name of Islam. So this Islam, like the Muslim League that works in over 60 countries, supports this uh, Islam that is in favor of life supports young Muslims who are not radicalized, who uh, really represent hope. So in concrete, what does the Muslim League do to pursue this uh, objective? Uh, shukran. Uh, the World Muslim League carries out a number of different tasks. These tasks go along three main lines. First, they, it tries to represent the truth of Islam, and it tries to bring bridges with passion. It tries to uh, spread human values. It tries to spread uh, love for everybody and respect for everybody. So there are two main lines along which we fight. We try and fight against extremist ideas. So not only the ideas of political Islam, which are considered to be a core of extremism and terrorist uh, and terrorism and the second line we work along is to fight against counter extremism in other words we try and fight against uh, islamophobia and hatred against islam we try and fight against hatred against uh, islam so islamophobia these extremes uh, are reciprocally beneficial. I think the first uh, type of uh, extremism profits by the second one uh, because Islamophobia brings together all young people and pushes them uh, violently pushes them against to contrast to the violent extremistic thinking. The second line along which we work as a league is cooperation and dialogue with everyone. So we try and work on factors, on the factors that unite us. We try and spread uh, information on what we do, on the work we do thereby bringing together peoples and nations, because life is full of diversity. It is a varied life. It is full of diversities and differences. And this is what God wanted. God wanted a man's life to be different and varied. There is a passage in the Koran that states that this is exactly the nature of life and that we will continue being diverse and varied. And we believe that this doesn't mean that one always needs to be in conflict with one another one. We shouldn't be afraid of the other. We have been very happy that we've had the chance to sign a number of agreements with uh, religious uh, organizations and with social organizations uh, or humanitarian ones, and this uh, all over the world. I am very happy of the fact that Cardinal Turan visited Saudi Arabia, when the World Muslim League signed with the 
uh, Pope's Council the document uh, uh, of dialogue uh, between the religious under the guidance of uh, Cardinal Turan. That was a cooperation agreement uh, that represented the very first example of uh, the very first example of an agreement like that uh, for the League. The document uh, This document brought together all the thinkers, all the scholars, experts in the Islamic world. Over 1,200 muftis and scholars gathered together in Mecca and published a historical document, which can be rightly considered one of the most important documents of our time. That's actually the Mecca document that was signed by 1,200 muftis and experts. This document enshrines the real values of Islam, and it talks about uh, the real, authentic nature of Islam and the vision of Islam of uh, the other. And it also explains the role of religious organizations as well as civil, uh, not governmental organizations, Above all, it talks about the organizations who uh, focus on education and on their role. It also talked about young children, youth in general. We have also signed a document with the Russian Orthodox Church this was signed uh, about two months ago. And this is a document that focuses on the activities that we can perform together to achieve our respective goals. We believe that some of these common objectives, uh, if they are implemented at the world level, they will inevitably reinforce peace and harmony in the world. The third uh, line that we focus on as a league concerns humanitarian aid and services. The Muslim League is a world organization, and it is the organization that provides assistance and development. Uh, so there is an, uh, an, an organization within the league that provides this, and it brings a uh, humanitarian aid all over the world uh, with no discrimination that might be connected to religious or political uh, or ethical or ethnic uh, sorry problems uh. so humanitarian work uh, shouldn't be contaminated by these kinds of con of discriminations and the world uh, Muslim League has furthermore organized a number of conferences and it presented a number of programs and initiatives. The last one was the Colombo project in Sri Lanka some days ago. Some days ago, a world conference uh, took place. Uh, uh, this was attended by political, <coughs> intellectual, religious, uh, and spiritual leaders who are very influential, who then uh, published the Colombo Declaration. After the negative events uh, uh, that uh, hit the city of Colombo, uh, following also the events of Christ Church in New Zealand and after the events of the, the event of the events of the Jewish churches in Pennsylvania and uh, California so these accidents do not express uh, they, they only 
um, testify to the fact that those who uh, did them have extremistic and terroristic ideas. When such events take place, we realize that terrorism and violence do not have any religion. They don't have any collocation. They don't have any, any time. Thank you. So thank you, Your Excellency Alaisa. After listening to your contributions, it came to my mind that fighting against concepts uh, does not take place between various interpretations of Islam. It's not a fight again uh, between good Islam and bad Islam. It is a fight between compassion and nihilism. So the Muslim League works uh, like uh, uh, was said, works along three lines uh, to face the ideology of terrorism. Then it is open towards the other, as was well explained, and then the uh, kind of compassion and charity work. I would also like to add that the League builds schools. They support hundreds of uh, thousands of students all over the Islamic world. They very much they provide great support to orphans. These investments in the future, the support uh, to the future, like was rightly said by Professor Roy, is the only way out we have to come out of this crisis. We have to support those who are not yet radicalized. We have to invest in life. Plus, in today's reality, what are the things that you, Professor, uh, are a sign of hope for us? No. Well, I have bad news and good news. It depends from uh, your point of view. Secularization won. Society is no longer profoundly religious, and I'm talking about our societies, but not only our societies. In the West, secularization has a long, a long history. But the dominating culture of today is no longer a religious uh, secularized culture. Uh, in the Muslim world, for instance, uh, there is a process of uh, secularization underway. And uh, fundamentalism is a reaction to this uh, secularization, but also a, a driver of secularization because um, the law kills the spirit. When a religion turns into a system of laws, it dies. Consequently, there is a disconnection between uh, religion in general and the dominating culture. And this leads to the fact that religion is today free, autonomous. It has been freed from its uh, cultural and political uh, links. And uh, Catholic means global. So this is not a Western culture we are talking about. It is a culture per se. This autonomy of uh, religion makes it possible for communities of believers and uh, have new, acquire new responsibilities to fight against hatred. 
this is for instance we have the Abu Dhabi declaration on the dialogue between the Pope and Al-Azhar this is extremely interesting also in the declaration of the Mecca these are very important um, uh, declarations, uh, statements, because well, there are different levels of responsibilities. This is my personal interpretation, and I have not studied these texts. Anyway, the first responsibility is the fight against violence carried out in the name of religion. And here, it is clear that uh, religious authorities, both Christians and uh, Muslims, uh, are against this uh, use of uh, religion in uh, uh, purposes that are uh, in favor of hatred. This is uh, sometimes un not very popular, but it is something that is very, very important. There cannot be hope in a world of hatred. The second responsibility, from my point of view, concerns the message that is uh, transmitted to the secularized society. Because here there are uh, some uh, intra-religious um, dialogues, in, and uh, we can find an agreement among different believers. But what can we say to those who do not believe? Uh, we have, first of all, to accept that there are people who do not believe, uh, who do not have a religion. This is extremely important as well. And this freedom of conscience uh, can be reached only in a free society. Tolerance is not enough. We need more. We need mode. We need to acknowledge the other. We need to fight for citizenship. This is a very important aspect, I think. And to conclude, we cannot impose values through laws. A state can impose laws, but not values. It, and we cannot impose values through identities because uh, an identity is not enough to impose values. So we go back to a very s simple element, the spirit. But here we are outside my sphere of competence. His Excellency Alaisa, well, the same question to you. Do you think there is hope? And what are the elements in our reality that support this hope for the future? Well, we always hope. in a fruitful future based on cooperation in the name of harmony and peace among peoples to cancel extremism and uh, closure, so to speak, from all societies in the world. This hope is reinforced through real efforts. It is reinforced when we have a clear vision, a clear objective. And an organized way to work with the others. In the world's uh, Muslim League, we carried out many common projects 
the conferences and the initiatives of the League are not single individual elements. They put people together, all different people, all kinds of people. We organize a lot of conferences in the whole world, in Europe as well, and in the United States. And in Asia. And all these conferences focus on the themes that we dealt with today. We try to involve young people in our work. We try to give them good advice. But there are also other important themes we deal with that are connected with uh, the way we can actually overcome this crisis. The, the awareness of the family, for instance, education, an education that needs to be connected to the idea to teach young people and children how to create a relationship with the others, how to love the others, how to understand life in a real way, how to learn to think. So we are trying to make young people immune through education and teaching. So these are very important elements, factors. NGOs and mass media have an important role to play to reinforce these hopes. Political slogans should stop firing up racism and hatred because these slogans go against all our efforts. I would like to talk about the importance to identify the problem, to make a diagnosis. When we have the right diagnosis, then we have uh, more hopes to solve the problem. Because so we know what the results could be, the causes of uh, extremism, radicalization, the slogans that uh, uh, feed uh, the conflict between cultures can be summarized in a couple of points. First of all, the ignorance of the others. There are stereotypes, there are bias that come from a single-minded interpretation of reality rather than from dialogue and uh, um, exchange of views. And there is the, the fear of the others. Um, we often say that those who believe in their causes and in their principles, uh, well, they do not need to fear the others. And another cause is the theory, the theory of conspiracy, blaming the others. Uh, being unable to understand the rights of the others, the right to believe in what everyone wants and in adopting the principles one wants to adopt. No one can be obliged to follow a certain creed, a certain way of thinking. The manipulation of uh, tests and words from uh, uh, our religious tests, tests 
means tampering with the, the concept of a personal belief and mutual understanding. I have the right to be understood, but I cannot oblige someone to follow my way of thinking. أيضا أحب أن أختم بأنه من المهم We should not isolate young people um, and children from their societies. They should not be brought away, taken away from the societies and the communities where they live. They have to participate. Minorities should be an integral part of the community where they live. They have the right to religious education exactly as the majority has. And they have the right to study uh, the same number of hours like the majority. Furthermore, it is important that we comply by the law and, the, uh, and freedoms and uh, in compliance with the law, we have to distinguish between freedom and responsibility, between freedom and anarchy, between freedom and the firing up of violence. We should uh, speak out loud against uh, slogans based on hatred and racism that induce uh, violence and which uh, lead uh, to conflicts between nations and peoples, thereby threatening stability and peace. All of us, especially minorities, have to respect the state where they live. They have to respect the culture hosting them. I would also like to say that there is uh, no choice. I mean, uh, all over the world, we have no other choice. We have no choice other than peace. And peace can be achieved only through mutual understanding and compassion. Mutual understanding and accepting diversities are paramount. We have to be different, but at the same time, we have to love each other. We have to be different, but at the same time, we have to uh, feel sympathy towards the others. We have to coexist and tolerate. We have to be tolerant. We have to cooperate. We all need everybody else. We cannot have peace or stability unless these conditions are met. Thank you. Religion is not something closed. Religion is not empty. 
all religious values need to be embodied. And any investment in the future has to start from the person, from the individual. I think there is no better way to conclude this wonderful uh, speeches and contributions like this. Uh, my personal hope is here, in this room, in this area, which is called meeting. Because the meeting is an area that testifies to openness, openness, the openness that is granted thanks to the work of 3,000 volunteers. It is uh, granted thanks to small donations. So small donations which uh, make the meeting independent, which make this place independent. So we would like to ask you to keep this place as independent and as beautiful as well as welcoming as is now. It is welcoming towards all the outstanding personalities. So please continue donating to the meeting so that the meeting remains open and welcoming to everybody. I would like to thank His Excellency Alaisa wholeheartedly. I would like to thank Professor Roy wholeheartedly for being, both of you, for being so frank and deep. And thanks to all of you. And I wish you a fruitful continuation of the Rimini meeting. Thank you very much.